Hey everyone, welcome to the latest episode of Total Market Talk. My name is David Chattel. I am the CEO and founder of NGL Media and the chairman and founder of the New Generation Latino Consortium. Today my guest is Jose Villa. He is the founder and president of Census Agency, an integrated cross-cultural advertising agency based in LA, servicing such clients as Union Bank, United Healthcare, FDA, CDC, Coast Guard, and many others. Jose, I'd love you to tell our viewers a little bit more about yourself and then we'll get this conversation started. Thanks, David. So, uh, yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, I mean, you guys know about Census, and um, I started the agency about 17 years ago. Um, I kind of accidentally got into the advertising business. It wasn't my intended path. In, in college, I was an economics major, and I actually started going down the path of uh, going into the economic development field um, and uh, started building a website to publish some some of my research findings coming out of uh, coming out of college undergrad, uh, and that's kind of how I started getting into this business. I uh, started building websites. Uh, people started hiring me, and, and then what eventually became my company to build websites. Same time, I started a dot com in the late '90s, focused on the Hispanic market, um, and that's kind of where where I got introduced to multicultural marketing. Um, worked with a lot of Hispanic agencies in the early years of the agency, um, uh, helping them. Um, integrate digital into their practice and uh, over the years uh, grown grown the company um, sort of expanded out from our core of uh, developing initially Spanish language websites was what we started doing uh, back in the uh, back in 2000 when I officially started uh, what is now census um, before I actually started all these businesses I was a, I was a consultant uh, I was a strategy consultant working with fortune fortune 1000 companies helping them with big strategic issues um, and uh, you know, I I grew up here in Los Angeles. Um, I went to college on the East Coast, went to business school on the East Coast. Um, and I lived in Spain for a while, and um, have have uh, have loved sort of being in this business at a time when it's been so rapidly changing. Okay, terrific. Thank you for sharing that. So I think what viewers would love to know, as the theme of this of this conversation is definitely total market, which we're going to get into in great detail. I think people are interested to understand how agencies like Census are thriving in what is now called this total market space and what you're doing to differentiate yourselves from not only other Hispanic agencies and African American or multicultural agencies, but the general market agencies as well. And I think you mentioned you might even have a graphic that helps best explain this. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, our, our model is based on sort of differentiation um, as it relates to the Three dominant type of three dominant agency models that exist today. Um, there's the multicultural agency, there's the general market agency, and then there's the digital agency. And so, census uh, is sort of a square peg that doesn't fit in any of those round holes, um, and that's on purpose. So, you know, the multicultural agency obviously specializes in um, in one ethnic group, often works in a silo, and is really focused on the differences between one particular ethnic group. Right, their whole business model is structured around focusing on the differences. Um, a general market agency uh, it basically starts with the general market. They, they also treat um, ethnic audiences in a silo. They, they tend to view ethnic audiences as an add-on. They treat them as separate and distinct. Um, and, and often, uh, most often, either have no little or no ethnic expertise or treat it as a subgroup within their agency. Um, and then a digital agency um, tends to be very tactically driven, um, obviously focused on digital tactics. Very strong technical background, but limited traditional capabilities, and much like the general market agency, uh, probably even more so, lacks any of those ethnic insights. So the, the census model is basically takes elements of all three uh, agency models. We're very strategically di uh, driven. We have digital at our core. We started as a digital agency. We don't have a separate digital group here. Um, and the same with ethnicity. We don't treat ethnicity as a department here. Um, we have a team of people that come from Hispanic, African American, Asian marketing, and we integrate all those two, all those, uh, uh, all those ethnic understandings within one agency, right? So we help our clients reach across all these different ethnic audiences, and we're much more focused on the similarities between these groups as opposed to the differences, and that's really important. Thank you for sharing that, Jose. Obviously, your model is extremely progressive, and uh, one that I think our viewers are going to appreciate hearing more about. So beyond what you just explained, you tout at Census what you call an integrated cross-cultural approach, which is one that is obviously a little bit different than what we call total market. I'd love you to talk about how cross-cultural differentiates from total market and, and in the third place differentiates itself from multicultural. I know you sort of like to talk about these three things um, in their own buckets, if you will. Sure, sure. So, um, so the, the integration piece basically uh, refers to, at its, at its uh, 
most basic level refers to integration of services and capabilities. So, you know, uh, public relations, uh, we, we tend to think about it in terms of paid media, owned media, and earned media, right? So we integrate those capabilities. We think that's really important. But, but I think the deeper sense of integration is um, with regards to ethnicity and different ethnic audiences. And that's the cross-cultural model that we have. Um, and so the way we look at it is there's sort of our three somewhat competing. There's a little bit of, I think there's quite a bit of overlap with the three models that people are discussing these days, but there's, there's multicultural, there's total market, and then there's what we use, what our approach, which is cross-cultural. Multicultural is pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. I think most people agree it's, it's, it's ethnic specific. It's focusing on one particular ethnic audience. Um, some would argue about the nuances of that, whether you, you are, um, you know, treating audiences, uh, you know, treating them in a silo. I would argue that it is. Um, so that's one model. Um, the second one that everyone's obviously debating these days is total market. And to me and, and to our agency, total market is, is basically an attempt to layer in ethnicity, uh, ethnic audiences into a general market approach, right? Um, it is, uh, it is starting with the general market and that's really the key difference, right? I'll talk about when I, when I, with regards to cross culture, it's starting with the general market and then layering in whether it's insights, uh, talent, um, you know, uh, elements of culture into the marketing communications or even just media plans, right? Tactically, right? Um, you know, running some creative in ethnic media. Um, Cross-cultural is, is, it's nuanced. Um, you know, some, some might view it as the same as total market, but I think it's fundamentally different. And, and our perspective is you start with ethnic audiences. You treat them as uh, the starting point as opposed to starting with a quote unquote general market audience. I think that is incredibly important, particularly in parts of the country today where the ethnic minorities are the majority, right? So if you're in California, you're in um, you know New York City, if you're in Miami, starting with a quote unquote general market audience makes no sense. Um, and then you are developing work that crosses over. That is the intention, it's on purpose. You're trying to find the similarities between different ethnic audiences. And um, something that is I think really missing from a lot of the discussion is you're looking at all ethnic audiences. It's not just a Hispanic and general market um, uh, integration. It's about Hispanics, African Americans, uh, Asians. And that is really one of the things that we think is completely missing um, from most of the work out there. They're treating, they're, they're really just, when, when they say multicultural or integrating eth ethnicity, they're talking about Hispanic only. So that is, that is, the, that is the cross-cultural model we use. Um, it's about starting with ethnic insights and looking to cross over with your work. Yeah, I mean, there. I think there is definitely a lot of confusion in the marketplace. Uh, anytime, I mean, there is already confusion in the marketing world because of all the changes that are taking place. Tech, you know, from a technology perspective, um, and then obviously with all the demographic changes in this country, um, to then introduce all these different uh, models of marketing, I think, is uh, introducing a lot of confusion, um, especially when when there are not clear definitions of these things. Um, ultimately, I think it's important as an industry that we, you know, that we, we help our clients move forward um, and uh, position themselves for the future. I, I do think that some of the models, and to be fair, our model, cross-cultural marketing, is not for everyone. Uh, I think a lot of organizations, a lot of brands um, would probably be best served by sticking to the basics and, for instance, um, you know, just taking a multicultural approach to start with uh, because they still are leaving money um, consumers on the table. And, and I view cross-cultural as sort of a more of an advanced approach that, that is not for everybody. Um, and, 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 I, and, and you shouldn't start with cross-cultural. You need to have sort of deep understanding of ethnic audiences, both within your organization and with your agency, to really be able to pull that off. And most, I, you know, if you look at, for instance, like, you know, AHA and a lot of other trade organizations, they, they put out reports every year or every couple of years on which industries are investing um, you know, uh, in, in ethnic marketing and whether they're laggards or, you know, uh, market leaders, you know, the grand majority of, of marketers in this country are, are in the laggard category. And so it doesn't make sense for them to, to, to try to leapfrog into these more advanced models. Um, I think the market will eventually move towards that, you know, we think cross-cultural is going to be the model that most people are going to start using, but that's going to take time um, as the demographic shifts take hold. Um, those those uh, th those models will be adopted, but in the interim, I think it still makes a ton of sense for companies to still take a multicultural approach. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, I think the industry is already very much moved on from the argument of, of language um, alone. Every I think most everybody is talking about culture um, as it relates to the Hispanic market. Increasing that fair share, I think. I think you need to like dive into those numbers and understand what's really driving them. And you know the you know the percentages. You know you know people talk about what, seven to eight percent, maybe nine percent is the highest number I've seen of marketing spend is going against Hispanics when they make up you know double that um, in terms of the size of the market. The, the, the reason for that, I would argue, is because you have a lot of uh, companies that are not investing at all or very little, or they're just recently entering the marketplace. You know, most of the spending in Hispanic marketing is coming from a small number of industries. Um, there are a plethora of other industries that are not investing in the Hispanic market, and I think that number gets closer to where it should be when they start to come into the marketplace. And some of them are starting to, I mean, you start to see pharma, for instance, really investing in Hispanic more than they ever have before. But there, I mean, there are a ton of industries that are completely behind electronics. And, and probably the, the, the one big, big challenging area is, is like a lot of these new technology companies, a lot of these sort of disruptive companies like Amazon and, and, and Uber that they don't, they don't see a need to do ethnic marketing. You know, they're, they're doing well. And it creates a bit of a conundrum for our industry, right? Why, why doesn't Uber need to market to Hispanics, they seem to be doing very well. Exactly. Now, you're sort of making it about if there were more advertisers, we would have much closer to our fair share. My question to you is though, doesn't it go beyond just bringing in more advertisers and really get into more advertisers spending more money across all platforms in both languages, as opposed to just doing, I'll say traditional Hispanic marketing. So if they came in and they just did traditional Hispanic, I would contend that it would still not represent a high enough percentage of the total population that we represent. Yeah, but I think you need to, um, I agree uh, to a certain extent. However, a lot of the media consumption that's occurring among the 55 million Hispanics um, is, is not occurring all on, on ethnic uh, specific media channels and, and platforms. And as I would argue the industry, the advertising industry moves away from paid media as the sole way of reaching, you know, as the primary driver for marketing. Um, that's going to distort those numbers even more um, as we get into more content marketing and, and um, you know, uh, I would argue more advanced ways of, of marketing that focus on owned and earned media as opposed to paid media. Um, but I mean, you know, part of the problem is the way that those numbers are calculated, right? How do we calculate that 8% number based off of spend on Spanish language or ethnic specific media. Right. But if, if you know, 60% of Hispanics are U.S. born, let's say half of them are consuming media on general market platforms, you could be arguably targeting them but then, but, and, 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 and spending against them, but it's not being counted in that 8% because you're using mainstream media or you're even using um, channels that aren't measured uh, that are not paid media to reach them. So I think there's an inherent problem in the in the, the way that the metrics are calculated. But when you say targeting, you mean they could be getting a general market message, even though they're obviously Latino, African American, etc. But the real question is, is that message culturally relevant? And would it be received that much more um, positively if something was done that was in culture as opposed to just for everybody and they happen to be seeing it? Curious to hear sure. your thoughts on that. Yeah, and that, and that goes back, I think, to a little bit of that argument about total market and cross-cultural. I, I would argue that if, uh, you know, if, if brands that are being really smart about reaching Hispanics and moving beyond just, you know, ethnic media to reach them, they need to be doing work that's cross-cultural, that, 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 that leverages culture to be effective. Um, and then the question becomes, is the work that they're running out there, is the, is the marketing and the messaging that's out there, is it cross, in our, in our opinion, is it cross-cultural? Is, is, it, is it in culture? Is it, rele is it um, relevant to uh, a U.S.-born Hispanic who consumes 80% of his media in English but has a very strong cultural identity as a Hispanic? That's where the measurement becomes very difficult, right, where you're saying are, you, you need people basically measuring uh, qualitatively the, um, how effective the, the, the communications is. Well, there's two, I think, key things, concepts to understand as it relates to digital and multicultural total market. Um, the first is the post-click experience. Um, and, and the second is understanding the behavior of multicultural audiences online. So um, in terms of the post-click experience, so there, you know, everybody talks about the importance. I actually, I would add a third element to understand is, and, it, and that is 
a concept which is moving beyond the simplicity of the over index argument because that's basically and I'll start there um, so much of you know when people talk about digital in the in the multicultural markets particularly Hispanic they always talk about the over index Hispanics over index on mobile Hispanics over index on social yep. that that that's interesting but not really all that helpful and insightful um, it does not help us understand how they act differently online, how do we reach them online in a way that is effective? Um, and how, does, how do we leverage their behavior? Because online, behavior is the most important um, sort of uh, uh, action or, or sort of uh, element that you need to understand to be effective. Um, so we need to get beyond this like overly simple uh, over-index argument. Second, um, you know, multicultural marketing has been effective in, you know, one of the benefits of digital is, is the targeting capability. So you can target somebody at levels of granularity that are absurd, right? We know that, you know, you can target people demographically, uh, behaviorally, contextually. You know, I always joke to our clients, you know, you're trying to reach a Latina lawyer who's left-handed and lives in Cleveland. You know, digital is really the only way you could actually conceivably pull that off. You probably could. Um, and that's great, right, in terms of paid media. You can target an ad, whether that's a banner ad, an online video ad to, to that left-handed Latina lawyer in Cleveland. But the problem becomes the post-click experience. What happens after she clicks on that ad? Where does she go? And that's where the third issue I, uh, that I would bring up, which is the changing behavior of, of multicultural audiences online. I, we've seen this from um, countless research that we've done for our clients um, and from a lot of syndicated uh, data that Hispanics particularly and um, other ethnic audiences, Asian audiences particularly as well, do not prefer to consume content in English online. They, they prefer to conduct um, important transactions, particularly like e-commerce transactions, in English. They're preferred, they don't find any value in and, and tend to see anything that's in language as being inferior. This might be a, this might be a result of, unfortunately, a lot of um, uh, under, in, uh, under investment on the part of brands, you know, um, many years ago when they started launching Spanish language websites or uh, in language web properties, they, they almost always were inferior. And I think the consumer figured that out and started saying, I'm not going to do, you know, I'm not going to do searches in Spanish. I'm not going to do uh, transactions in Spanish because this is probably an inferior experience um, to the to the English version. And so they've come to prefer English and in many ways are, even if they're Spanish dominant, are still learning how to navigate in English because they know that is the best practice. And so all that, when you take all that together, there's this big issue online of the post-click experience when it comes to multicultural, which is, you're sending people to websites to digital experiences that are that do not take um, culture into consideration, and that's I think what's been completely missed from from any discussion. Digital agencies, as I talked about before, with regards to our business model, and I think some of the inherent flaws in their business models, they don't even think about culture, uh, and so there really has been very little done to make the post-click experience, the owned media, websites, digital experiences, um, uh, you know, culturally relevant. Um, I would argue cross-cultural. And so I think that's like a really interesting place that, you know, we're trying to take our clients and I'm trying to start a discussion around because nobody's thinking about that. This is a bit of a sneak preview into the next research um, that we're going to be unveiling at the beginning of 2016 here at Census. And we're going to be shifting to the next generation, uh, moving beyond millennials, uh, we're already kind of talking about how millennials are so yesterday, and um, and if you think about it, in many ways they are. I mean, they're they're you know the 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 top end of millennials are hitting their mid thirties, and so we're really focused on the future and specifically the generation that's twenty and under. Um, uh, their their name has not been sort of codified yet, but you know we think uh, we're calling them Gen Z. We think that's the the next yeah, that's going to be the moniker that's going to stick with them. And we fundamentally think that they're going to change everything in terms of multicultural marketing. In terms, in terms of this country, they, they make up the largest uh, uh, generational cohort in the United States by far, 25%, larger than baby boomers. And they also make up the largest percentage of Hispanics in the U.S. today, also about 25%. So if you're at all focused on the future of this country, you have to start thinking about Gen Z. And the, the premise that we have, some of the early research that we've done, and I'll share kind of a little sneak peek into it, is that they're really going to change everything uh, as it relates to Hispanic marketing, multicultural marketing more broadly in the country. Um, and I'll share a couple slides here. So the, the first point that I think it's important to understand is – that unlike their parents, the majority of Hispanic Gen Z were born in the United States, 
Hispanic Gen Z were born in the United States. Um, that's that's almost a 50% increase over the previous generation, millennials, in terms of the percentage that were born here. Um, it's also um, important to note, I'm gonna stop here for a second. The, the second point is, and I will share this, um, the, the other really important point is language. Um, Hispanic Gen Z, 75% um, of Hispanic Gen Z are English dominant. That means they don't speak a word of, of Spanish nor consume any media in Spanish. So you can imagine what this, this age group that in 10 years is gonna be that prime 18 to 24 year old or even 24 to 34 year old audience, their media consumption is gonna really fundamentally alter um, the Hispanic marketing landscape. And then, Two really interesting points that I think uh, to kind of leave you guys with about Hispanic Gen Z that I think is is also going to change a lot about um, what we think about is there, the difference between Hispanic Gen Z and Hispanic Millennials. Um, I I think history tends to work in waves and tends to skip generations in a certain in, in a certain sense. And I think I think history will go down and we'll see that that uh, Millennials are very similar to baby boomers, and we're going to see that Hispanic Gen Z are very similar to um, Gen Xers. And so two, two really interesting points is this idea that Hispanic Gen Z from the early data we're seeing is that they emphasize physical relationships over technology driven relationships, you know, digital relationships, more so than millennials. They're, they're more into the importance of having a phys physical contact with people, which is a complete paradigm shift from what we think about younger audiences. <clears throat> And then the other really important, you know, I think another really important point to kind of leave everybody with is um, is, is around one of the notions that's very common uh, when we think about Hispanics in this country, and that is um, the importance of family. Um, this is early data. Obviously, these are um, Hispanics that are under 20 today, but the early data shows us that Hispanic Gen Z are less likely to want to have a family. Um, and so you can imagine what a monumental shift that is in terms of everything we think about the Hispanic market um, for this coming generation that represents a quarter of the entire Hispanic population to be stating, um, albeit early in their life, that they don't intend to have a family. Um, so that, that is a, that's going to really kind of shake everything up, we think. And so obviously there's a lot more we're going to go into with regard to Gen Z. And I think it's going to really open a lot of eyes around kind of the future of the marketplace. Wow, very cool stuff, Jose. I think you shared like four paradigm shifts <laughs> throughout that brief presentation. Again, you heard it here first, folks, on Total Market Talk. Check out HispanicMillennialProject.com. Thank you for sharing that, Jose. The, the cross-cultural approach that we, um, that we take uh, can be executed in a couple different ways. Um, this, the, this UCLA work that we did, so UCLA Extension is – a certificate program um, that's offered both here locally in Los Angeles and nationwide. It's one of the largest extension programs in the country. Uh, and they were looking to generate awareness of, you know, basically how you could change your career, you, how you could jumpstart your career and how you could fundamentally change the trajectory of your life by starting to take a, a class um, in a new area that you have a passion about. And so um, we decided to highlight um, some of the some of the people that teach the classes at UCLA Extension, which is one of their differentiators. These are some of the their leaders in their industry. So you're not you're not being taught a class by um, you know an academic. You're being taught if you want to learn uh, screenwriting, you're going to actually have a, a, a successful screenwriter teaching a screenwriting course for you. And so one of the insights that we you know obviously in Southern California, a big uh, a big uh, majority of the population is Hispanic, and so we wanted to the cross cultural approach was 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 based off of an insight um, that we identified that Hispanics, um, and this is not a, not a groundbreaking insight, that Hispanics um, are, are more likely to indicate that they intend to start their own business in the future. Um, so even if they're working for a large corporation, um, unlike the general market, um, who may be just looking for a career shift by taking some of these classes, for Hispanics, this also meant that I would be potentially interested in starting a new business and getting out of the corporate world. And so we did a, a series of ads and they were basically uh, real life vignettes on some of the uh, folks whose lives have been transformed by UCLA Extension. And one individual who's Brazilian, Fernando, um, he is a uh, interior design, but he got into interior design and we showcased his story um, and how that led to him both changing careers Importantly, in that this was the Hispanic insight, starting a business, um, and then ultimately becoming a professor at um, at UCLA Extension. 
Okay, with that, let's take a look at the UCLA Extension Spot produced by Census. Enjoy. Behind every artist are the influences that guide them. Mine began with my father, who opened my eyes to shapes and angles. An instructor saw my talent for interiors, leading me to a career designing hotels worldwide. Now, I'm the teacher, inspiring design students of all ages and backgrounds. My name is Fernando de Morris, co-founder of Creative Resource Associates, and I'm proud to teach at UCLA Extension. Wow, really interesting insights there, Jose. Thanks for sharing that spot with us. I believe you had another one. It, it was a little bit of a different um, angle on this idea of cross-cultural. We'd love you to uh, set it up, and then we'll, we'll take a look at that as well. Sure. So we, uh, uh, we've been working with a client uh, uh, within the federal government, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and they, um, they tasked us with developing a campaign to reach out to all legal permanent residents in the United States that had not taken the final step of becoming citizens. Um, and, and the challenge there was that this was not one specific ethnicity or nationality per se, right? This cut across the Asian market, um, the Hispanic market, and also a lot of English speaking uh, immigrants that were leaving, living in this country um, from places like Australia, Great Britain. And so we had to develop one campaign, one concept, one TV spot that worked across all these different audiences. We found a universal insight, which was um, the desire for these immigrants to still hold on to their country of origin, but embrace the benefits of becoming a citizen so that you could be proud of being from the Philippines or from Colombia, but you could still be an American citizen and not let go of that. So we developed a cross-cultural spot that cut across all these different groups and languages, right? We obviously developed it in English, but the insight was one that cut across, that was shared, and the research that we did, which was significant, and we did in-language research in Chinese, in, uh, in Korean, in Spanish, uh, and in English, uh, was really sort of the basis for this. Okay, sounds great. Let's take a look at the spot. When I first came to the U.S. I brought my hopes and dreams for a better life. Since becoming a U.S. citizen, I'm running for public office. I've traveled with the freedom and security of a U.S. passport. And I voted for President of the United States. U.S. citizenship means a better life. I chose opportunity. I chose freedom. I chose responsibility. I chose to become a U.S. citizen. I am a proud American. American. Okay, terrific. That was definitely the epitome of a cross-cultural spot, folks. Uh, you saw it here first. Uh, what I want to do is wrap up by looking towards what's shaping the future of the Hispanic market and another article that, Jose, that you wrote uh, earlier this year. It was called Eight Seismic Changes in the Hispanic Market. I would like to do is have you highlight some of these changes uh, in just a few sentences and tell viewers why the sum of these parts adds up to huge implications, as you say, for how to engage Hispanics in 2015 and beyond. So take it away. Great. Yeah. So I think there's a, some, some big shifts that are occurring in the marketplace that are going to fundamentally reshape it. Um, in terms of the Hispanic market, I think a couple of those key shifts are lower projected growth of the U.S. Hispanic market, primarily being driven by U.S. born versus immigrants into this country. I think the really important shift there to take in, into consideration is the fact that most of the immigration in this country is going to start coming from Asian uh, immigrants who are going to be of a higher socioeconomic status. Um, the pay TV bundle crumbling, I think, is one of probably the biggest shifts that's going to be occurring as, as consumers move away from buying bundled cable TV and start watching you know, programming that they want when they want that's often ad, not ad supported, I think is going to fundamentally not just change the multicultural marketing business, but all uh, marketing. And then, you know, I think the other big one is just the, the changing nature of the Hispanic market as Hispanics continue to um, graduate and go to college as their wealth increases. Um, and the overall U.S. born population with regards to the number of kindergartners that are in the United States that are Hispanic, you're going to see a very different Hispanic market in about 10 to 15 years than you have today. Okay, folks, you heard it here first. Again, lots of firsts today. The seismic shifts that will be changing our market going forward. What I'd like to do is thank Jose Villa, the founder and president of Census, for being here today. And we look forward to having him again on a future episode of Total Market Talk. Thank you, David. This has been a great conversation and uh, obviously look forward to hearing and to continuing the discussion and the dialogue around a lot of these really interesting and important changes that we all think need to be thinking about. All right. Until next time, guys, take care.